Hey, happy Thanksgiving. I think today's episode is going to be very on brand for family gatherings. Today we are talking about poisons and venoms. But before we get started, I know many of you are here for cannabis knowledge, and I want to briefly talk about the munchies, because they are an iconic part of cannabis consumption, and I think a lot of us are just as excited about that pre-Thanksgiving meal walk with the cousins as we are for the actual big meal. A lot of us don't actually like the munchies because maybe it makes us spend a lot of money on food or lose control of our food intake, and other people really like that aspect of cannabis consumption. However, did you know that the ability for THC to cause the munchies was actually part of the reason why THC was approved as an FDA-approved drug? For the ability to help people suffering with cancer or HIV and AIDS to maintain appetite and want to eat. This was written in the FDA drug approval notice for Marinol, which is literally just THC but produced synthetically. So even the munchies are medicinal. If you want to avoid the munchies, you can also check out products or flour that have THCV in them. THCV is a molecule that is super similar in structure to THC, but it has two less carbons. This small difference makes it act very different on the cannabinoid 1 receptor. So instead of binding and activating and giving you the munchies, it actually acts kind of in the opposite way and prevents this from happening so you don't have that rush of hunger and that rush of dopamine after consuming. So some bud like Durban Poison is high in THCV, but also... You can purchase THCV tinctures, hemp products, mints, so many other products. We're going to talk more on this in future episodes and how THC can cause an influx in hunger hormones like ghrelin, which is part of why we get the munchies. But remember, if your family is giving you a hard time about your cannabis consumption this holiday season, some good talking points to bring up and to be prepared for are talking about your endogenous cannabinoid system, which is how... THC interacts with your body and has so many different medicinal benefits. If you want to learn more about this, refer to episode six on this podcast titled How Cannabis Works in the Body. So back to this episode. Today, we have an evolutionary biologist, Dr. Seth Coleman, on the show to talk about some of my most special interests, and I guess his too, which are poisons and venoms. We say this later in the show, but just as a reminder while you're listening, poisons are ingested and venoms are injected. Both can kill you in really cool ways, but just as a reminder, you need to actually like eat or come in contact with a poison, but venoms need to be injected into your body through something like fang. A big shout out to all the patrons of this podcast. You make every episode possible, and thank you to everyone who took 30 seconds out of your day to review this podcast on Apple or Spotify. It seriously helps. It makes me incredibly happy. Okay, one last, last thing before we get going. I finally got around to making a website for this podcast. You can check that out at bioactivepodcast.com. And now you can suggest guests or suggest yourself as a guest by emailing guests at bioactivepodcast.com. You can tell that I designed this website because there's a section on haikus there where I post a new haiku almost every day along with an AI-generated image of what a computer's interpretation of that haiku is. For anyone who doesn't know, haikus are Japanese poems that are short, 17 syllable poems. They usually reflect nature in some way. And I have been an avid haiku writer since high school, where I went through a phase where I only updated my Facebook status with haikus. And no, I will never be sharing those. But if you also want to submit your own haiku, you can submit that at haiku at bioactivepodcast.com. And I will share them if you want, anonymously or not anonymously. So anyway, back to this show. I think you'll really enjoy it. I definitely did. It's one one of my favorite conversations. A lot of the listeners have really only ever really been familiar with like cannabis and maybe psychedelics as far as like bioactive substances go. So part of the goal of the podcast is kind of get people a little more interested in like things that act on the body and learn a little bit more of how your body works. And um, I just, I am obsessed with poisons and toxins. I think they're 
just so so interesting but i don't know a lot about like the evolutionary component of it and even like the biological component i'm very heavy on like the chemistry component so i really wanted to have you on to talk about that that's perfect because i'm not real heavy on the chemistry component i'm all about the evolution and the function you know both the evolutionary and ecological roles of these various substances and it's so cool the way we then co-opt these substances for our own use right like there are like oh seven God. different drugs now you you know that have been created <clears throat> specifically from like snake venom that are used in health and it's like snake venom it's it literally evolved to kill you know and here we are dude isol- yeah, i so know cool. and it's like <laughs> the dose matters so much and a lot uh, of the venoms are like so or even poisons poisons and venoms are mm-hmm. so specific like to a receptor just like no a drug doubt. is it's so cool exactly i totally agree <clears throat> okay, go. We'll talk about that for sure. Exactly. That's, that is just something I can't <clears throat> Okay, so I don't know a lot about your background, but yeah. I obviously follow your TikTok and I absolutely love it. My husband's a wildlife biologist. That's what you I'm said. I'm a That's natural so product cool. chemist. So yeah. yeah, we're like, you know, we have biology and chemistry are so intertwined in our life. Nice. And that's why like... Well, I really wanted to talk to you. So I know Perfect. your name's Seth Coleman, and I know yeah. you're on TikTok teaching evolutionary biology, but that's really all I know about you. So if you Fair could give enough. a little more background on you know, what you do, how you got involved in your field, and then we'll just kind of go from there. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, got, I actually got my undergrad in wildlife biology from the University of Montana. So my background cool. is in wildlife as well. And then it then it evolved, evolved, so to speak, into a degree, a PhD in evolutionary biology with a, an emphasis on animal behavior. I've just always been so friggin' fascinated with why animals do what they do, why peacocks look the way they look, you know, just like these ridiculous things, these massive weapons that male deer wear on their heads in the form of antlers. Like I just wanted to know so much more about what the whys and hows of these these incredible structures yeah so i went on to do a phd in animal behavior evolutionary biology studying sexual selection and mate choice i was not just interested in the bright colors and melodious songs but like what are the females doing when as they're choosing and selecting among males with all of these different elaborate traits and so i quite literally that's what i ended up doing my phd on is just understanding how females use different aspects of male displays and mate choice yeah, so what does that come down to? Like, what are the oh. female... You said birds, right? Like, what are the female birds looking for in the male displays? Well, I mean, the thing is, it can be all across the board. There are so many different little pieces of information that a male display might give to a female, might tell a female, making it valuable to her as she's deciding, you know, who to mate with. Um, so some of the display elements might indicate genetic quality, right? Quite literally, does that male have a robust genetic quality that keeps him relatively parasite free, relatively healthy in in good condition? And is that reflected like in the brightness of his skin patches, bright red skin patches or the length of his tail? These things that females are assessing in mate choice, they're not obviously thinking to themselves, oh, that's a really bright red skin patch. He doesn't have many parasites. Instead, evolutionarily, Females that choose males with the brightest red skin patches in this hypothetical species we're talking about yeah. benefit because their offspring are of higher genetic quality, are less likely to get sick, are more resistant to parasites because the male the female chose to mate with, based on the brightness of his skin patch that told her something about his quality, they inherit those genes from him and her offspring are thus more parasite resistance resistant and you know you get that evolutionary ball rolling where you get the benefits of choice indicated by the brightness of the color of the length of the tail and you get these incredible like the peacock right with all of these colors no, that's this ridiculous so display cool. that's telling females something about him yeah in that case do you like do you take genetic information and pair it with like the observations you make during the mating to try to make like okay like if if this is this bright red and we can match that with this genome displaying this whatever then we can tell that she was choosing that for this purpose yeah and we can actually do you know something a little more direct than that so for example in the satin bowerbirds that i studied for my phd um in northern new south wales australia Uh, What we were able to do is every year we'd get lots and lots of birds in hand using mist nets and traps 
Um, and so we take morphometric measurements and blood samples for DNA, as well as parasite uh, loads. So we count the number of ectoparasites on the exterior of the bird, and then we look for blood parasites in the blood samples, wow. and we could then correlate those to aspects of each male's display and then ask, okay, which of these males are being chosen as, as mates? And then ask questions like, okay, what is his parasite load? And what is, it, what is his mating success? And how brightly colored is he? And so we're, we're just putting all of these relationships together. Um, and you can do some really neat causal things. You can actually dose animals to get rid of their parasites. So you're actually kind of helping them a little bit and see how that ah. directly affects the quality of their displays, right? How does that affect the brightness of their colors? And so we have some pretty, we're really putting the puzzle pieces together when it comes to some of the benefits females enjoy by choosing males based on particular display elements, because we're starting to really understand what those display elements might tell her about that female or about that male. So yeah, it's, it's just fun. <laughs> Fun I mean, that's that sounds really fun. And it's like it's like piecing together so many important parts of science, which I think is like my Ph.D. was very dynamic, too. You know, I did yeah. part genetics. I did chemistry. I did field work, you know, and being able to be part of all the different things really makes you like understand and love science more, at least in my head. It was so fun to be part of like the entire story. So that's Absolutely. so cool. Are you still are you still working like with birds and that type of like no, I wish I stuff? wish I wish I were. I'm more of a backyard scientist now. So I still do a lot of teaching. I stay really busy. I stay really busy on TikTok obviously and a couple other places. I just love communicating science, uh, whether it's with and my that's students. that's the field, man. Yeah, like science communication. With followers, it's yeah, science communication because I mean, I think we're, you know, you and I are probably just preaching to the choir to each other, but you know, science is just this all encompassing, all important discipline and it's massive. And so for anybody who's not in science, I think to, to help not feel intimidated by science, it just requires really effective science communication by people who aren't necessarily doing the boots on the ground data collection and stuff, but by people who are one step removed but are able to sort of, you know, pick pick apart these studies and, and things and disseminate that information to a broader audience that isn't trained on how to like pick apart a study. Um, and so, All yeah, right. I love that. It keeps me connected to science and communicating yeah. science, which is what I love. <laughs> and you know, I'm sure that like, you don't have time to do both, like fully. Like you it's, need to, <laughs> you really need true. to be yeah. like, you know, your specialty is communication. Yeah. Or your specialty is, you know, lab work 24 seven. But right. I mean, when I was only doing lab work, I mean, I was working like 12, 14 hour days every day and like maybe sneaking yep. in like a little bit of social media. But you yeah. just you just can't do it all. And like, as you're saying, it's such a refined skill, like social media education, uh, like just being a communicator online yeah. that a lot of people who are the most brilliant scientists really don't have that skill and you need to work together to get this important information out there and to get the next generation of scientists interested in science. It's so important. I completely important. agree. Yeah, I love it the fact that, like you said, science communicator is now like a profession. It's a field. Yeah. It, it, that's, and I love that. That's so great. We've needed science communicators for a long time and I think now we're getting them. <laughs> Right. And I mean, as you know, like science is written in such a completely different language that we can't expect everyone in the general public to be able to be like, oh, a new a new paper was just published on spider venom. Let me check right. that out. And like, you know, it's, can you, just, it's so complex. Can you believe it was a single nucleotide polymorphism that led to that? You know, yeah, no, exactly. that's our job. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I can cut this part out, but just curious, are you like fine with being open about being a cannabis user? Because I think oh, yeah. that's really Abs cool. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I have no problem with that <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah, none at all. I was just gonna say I'm one of those, you know, worries. I, I'm one of those people that like my mind is blown when I think about how we not only normalize, but literally champion alcohol and alcohol abuse. Like, it, it's just such an incredibly destructive drug, right? And it's, but it's everywhere, you know? And yet, yeah. and then you have people vilifying, you know, other drugs, you know, cannabis, whatever it might be, while they're like drinking a beer every, you know, it's just like uh, the disconnect there is is remarkable to me. And I get it, some yeah. of the historical inertia, the sort of the social push, you know, the, uh, what was it, um, uh, 
I'm totally blanking on that famous, like it's sixties, uh, um, anti-marijuana, like, like reefer, uh, reefer, madness. Oh, reefer madness, reefer yeah, madness yeah, yeah. right. Just like painting cannabis and cannabis use and users as just these, like this awful drug, oh, these crazy God. people that lose their minds, you know, <laughs> like put their babies in the, in the, 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 the I guess there wouldn't be microwaves in 64 when were microwaves invented, but you get I the idea. Know. It's like, <laughs> yeah. there has been just a, a, like an effort to vilify cannabis and marijuana, while while our entire society is almost like built around the consumption of alcohol it's it blows my mind oh i mean and literally talking about poisons and toxins i mean yeah, alcohol exactly. literally like that's how it acts in your body and honestly i don't care if you consume a lot of alcohol i, I genuinely oh, yeah. don't no, do whatever yeah. you want but like why are we telling people to not consume a plant that has shown to have so many different medical benefits and it's shown to be so safe? Like I made a TikTok exactly. today showing like what's in my weed bag yeah. and everyone's like, this is this is when you know you're like an addict or when you know you have a problem. And I'm like, dude, I have a no. solution because I have a weed bag. You have a problem because you're caring about random people on the internet and what's in their bag. Like that's you, not me. <laughs> Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. This, cool. this, this disconnect between one drug and another drug, you know, with no sort of factual connection between it, between them is, uh, yeah, it just kind of blows my mind. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but I'm glad you are an open cannabis consumer. I assume yeah, no a problem. lot of like my mutuals on TikTok are cannabis consumers. So it's really cool that you talked about that because I want to talk about also, and I think the audience would really care about talking about like the evolution of cannabis and like yeah. insects and humans and like how did we get to this point that our body's producing these cannabinoid molecules but the plant is also producing these cannabinoid molecules that act on that same system yeah. and we feel the effects from it because you hear people say all the time like oh so like weed makes thc to interact with us like for that reason like our this or I guess more I should say that this system exists in our body right. for weed, you know, right. specifically for weed. And I'm like, no, like it's a lot older than that, but it's a, you're on the right track for thinking of like co-evolution of some sort. So exactly. I would love to like talk about this because it's one of one of my niche niche things that I love talking about is like the evolution and later my other niche thing I love learning about is toxins and poisons. <laughs> yeah, right on. And I love that because I, one of the, one of my favorite sort of stories about cannabis and its initial de domestication, a couple, you know, like, I think we're talking 12,000 years ago or something. I was actually doing some reading on the last couple of days is how interesting that this, like almost a mutualism seemed to evolve between humans and, and cannabis um, sativa, the initially domesticated uh, plant, and because we can actually watch it pop up historically along these trade routes once it was first domesticated. And I read a, a story about a, a 45 year old man who was buried in, in China about 5,000 years ago, and he had something like 600 grams of high THC yield bud on him. And the thinking is yeah. that maybe he was a shaman or something from, you know, from far off and happened to die on the trade route and was buried with some of his wares and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just this rich cultural history that we have with well, this and, plant. And there's the actual like use of medicine, which of course is like the focus of what we're talking about and what yeah. we care about today. But yeah. also the use as a textile, a fiber, like hemp was so, so, so valuable. It yep. is still so valuable because it's so strong. It's so weather tolerant. Like it is an amazing textile. Yeah. And humans have used, you know, every part of these plants for as long as it has been domesticated. Absolutely. And that's one of the most frustrating things about hemp or the lack of hemp in sort of the, the general supply material supply chain is that it has just been lumped in with unnecessarily marijuana, this idea of THC and drug use. And it's, it's literally an entirely different plant. I mean, the, you just, the two are related on an evolutionary basis, but they are not the same plant by any stretch of the imagination. One is used for really high value fiber that we just sort of reject because it's a cannabis plant. And the other is yeah. used for, you know, psychoactive purposes and has been for thousands and thousands and thousands of years.
Well, yeah. and part of the issue is like the plant is still genetically capable of producing THC, just not at sure. the same levels as like the kind right. that we're used to smoking. But as hemp farmers, it's a really risky crop to cultivate if you're growing it for fiber because the threshold is so small that 0.3% THC, hmm. that's the legal limit of what your hemp can have by weight. Okay. Um, okay. You know, it, it has to have less than 0.3% THC. And if it tests hot, they'll like cut down your whole field and like burn it. Like it's, that's, it's that's what so scary to grow yeah. these, these types of, of crops because, you know, obviously you, you need to make money off of that and that could just ruin your, your farming for years, if not ever, that could just shut you down completely. So, I mean, now there's even like cultivars of hemp that are being produced that have that gene for THC, THCA synthase knocked right. out of them so that they physically, genetically can't produce THC. So then it's a lot safer and less of an yeah. economic burden to start cultivating that type of plant, hemp plants, which is amazing. That's great. So we're using modern molecular techniques like knockout experiment, knockout techniques to, to yeah, remove THC from hemp hemp grow right. hemp, hemp based which we wouldn't plant. need to do if we didn't have stupid regulations That's, for it like exactly. zero zero point three percent is a completely arbitrary number like there's right. no science behind that zero point three percent someone just decided that that was a safe number and you know everyone's like oh well gmo like at that point it's a gmo hemp and it's like yeah we wouldn't have to do that but if, we wouldn't if <laughs> If the regulations didn't didn't make us, but right. yeah, it's it's ass backwards for sure. It really and, is. I mean, yeah. people do smoke um, hemp flour too. It's it's mm. very high in CBD and it can be very high in CBG as well. But huh. again, you're you're still in that area of, uh, you know, if you're cultivating it and it tests hot, you, your whole crop could be uh, could be at, at yeah. Risk. That's devastating. So it is what? Scary. One of my friends on uh, on TikTok actually is uh, is Kentucky Hemp Works, and okay. she's amazing. She actually sent me some hemp, you know, like last year. And we looked at it under the microscope and just talked about hemp and stuff. It was really fun. But I mean, Whoa. so many of her TikToks are just talking about like the latest lawsuit she's having to fight, you know, or the regulations she's having to like now the regulatory hoops she now has to jump through. It's just it seems like they make it so hard for hemp farmers to make it um unnecessarily oh, they do yeah just because of the, just because of the genus in which the crop they're growing belongs right just because it's a cannabis yeah and what you're talking about too just a lot of it is like logistically and politically and all this stuff like like it's hard enough to produce good hemp and to make mm. products and to sell it and according to the 2018 farm bill we should be allowed to have regular commerce with hemp products because mm. it's you know it's different than the other types of cannabis that produce high amounts of THC but the regulation every state's like oh no I don't I don't want to follow those you know laws and it's like but that's the law it's the 2018 yeah. farm bill and they're like no I'm uncomfortable with that and it's like why what is what is so dangerous about cbd flower that you feel the need to like regulate this it just doesn't make sense yeah cool well i think we should start like really simple of like why do animals adapt why do plants adapt like what are they doing when when these different organisms adapt in the wild and like what does that mean yeah, so I think that what's most important to recognize when we're talking about adaptation and evolution is that we're talking about traits that um, arise by a number of different means. Sometimes people get caught up on the idea of random mutation. So it's not, you know, we don't need to belabor that point. This is not necessarily a hardcore evolution podcast. Yeah. Um, but these traits evolve oftentimes as the result of a random mutation in the DNA. Um, and it results in something that benefits that organism at the time. And that could be a particular molecule. It could be a little flash of color, a little patch of color if it's in communication. But the point is that whatever this trait is that, that, er that arose, it benefits the individual in terms of survival and reproduction, which in terms of evolution, that's the currency, the ability to survive and reproduce, pass your genes on to the next generation. And so, you know, just, you know, thinking back to like the evolution of some of these chemicals in plants that we enjoy in everyday use, whether it's the flavors we love of like garlic and onion, 
these chemicals actually evolved into uh, stymie competition in other plants around them. They're called allelochemicals. And so an onion yeah. produces that onion flavor that we enjoy. That's actually a volatile chemical that essentially poisons the soil around it. So that it other says, plants don't, don't grow over here. Yeah, yeah, this is my to space, my space. Yeah, exactly, to reduce competition. And so at some point, eight, you know, eons back in the evolutionary history of onions, the ancestor to like onions and garlic and those others that produce these allelochemicals started producing these molecules that just made the soil around them that much less hospitable to competition. And of course that individual or that little group of, of ancestral onions would benefit from those chemicals. And so as much as those chemicals then are genetically heritable, that is they pass them on to their offspring, the next generation of little onion plants around that patch, those offspring onions would have those chemicals and would thus benefit. They would survive and reproduce better than their onion brothers and sisters in the other parts of the patch that aren't producing those chemicals. And so you have the then evolutionary spread of these traits that are advantageous, whether it's the allelochemicals in onions or potential antimicrobial effects of THC and other cannabinoids in cannabis, um, whether it's the venom in snakes and spiders and, um, and bees and wasps and things. All of these began with some adaptation that produced that first molecule that then benefited that individual who then passed it on to their offspring as they enjoyed the benefits of increased survival and reproduction. So yeah, that's really that. what we're talking about when we talk about adaptations. Yeah. So um, when we think about like plants or even microbes, like producing like drug like molecules, oftentimes, a lot of the times, at least with plants, um, that adaptation that the plant is, is making is oftentimes fighting against like insects or, or, herbivores of some sort something that wants to eat yep. them you know because because yep. that is survival at its like if there's a bug that's going to eat all of its leaves or all of its stem like that could kill it so the the plant needs to learn how to produce these bioactive substances that can interact with insects and like yeah. humans you know we aren't insects but we are closer to insects than like a plant is so like mm -hmm. uh, an insect's nervous system isn't that crazy different than our nervous system like there are a lot of the same systems and neurotransmitters so then when the plant's like producing a compound and it interacts with the insect's nervous system to like you know maybe kill it or maybe just like disarm it in some way that could, you know, potentially still be active on our nervous system. I don't know if you've read about this, but this is like the little niche part of evolutionary biology that I've like gone down a complete rabbit hole on. In the Love past. it. Love it. No, and that's that's exactly right. And it's kind of like you and I were talking about a little a few minutes ago. Dose matters, right? So in like the mustard family, like if you like strong mustard flavors, those yeah. flavors are actually antibacterial and anti-herbivore chemicals. Like those, those flavors that we enjoy of like mustards are, have literally evolved to try to uh, keep the plant safe from microbes like bacteria and fungi, but then also to deter um, uh, herbivores, specifically insect herbivores. And an insect that eats too much of a mustard plant gets really sick and that can actually die. Whereas we're just spreading these mustards, you know, this sauce all over the condiments, Everything. all over our foods, right? So and, and suffering no ill effects. But uh, but there are certainly uh, compounds that evolved as like anti pesticides, anti herbivory compounds that in certain doses can obviously still make us sick. I mean, cyanide literally in peach pits and like apple seeds, right? Yeah, that is an anti herbivore poison, right? To make herbivores sick that eat the seed. Because in fruit yes. evolution, yeah, the plant wants the frugivore to eat the fruit, but they don't want the fruit eater to digest the seeds. And so seeds are oftentimes packed with poison, but they're surrounded by these delicious fruits, right? So it's just this, I, I love it. It's just too much fun. It's so <laughs> cool how like the plant has evolved the different components of it to get the task done that it needs done. I mean, plants can't walk, they can't fight, they can't pick up like a sword and like, you know, fight something, but so they true. can produce some pretty insanely cool chemicals to get the, the job done. 
and structures to get those chemicals and stuff out there in those seeds. You know, plants, it, it still blows my mind that some seeds have wings attached to them, right? I mean, that's still, I love that. I know it and I love it. And it blows my mind when I think about it every time, even though I'm it, surrounded by maple trees and dandelions and stuff. But when I take a second to think about it, think about the fact that that maple seed is flying down from its, you know, from the branch on a wing, <laughs> you know, um, it's, yeah, once again, blows my mind every time. And I think this is where like this really beautiful interaction of chemistry and biology are, you know, just so intertwined. You can't think of them as separately because, you know, you sure. observe the biology a lot. But the reason that biology exists or the reason that biology is successful is because the chemistry behind it, which oftentimes we don't see or we just don't learn about because chemistry is hard. You know, everyone hates chemistry, but but there are just so many amazing examples in nature all around us. And oftentimes, even when we're describing like the terpenes in the cannabis plant, we're like, oh, like pinene, like pine trees, because there's a lot of redundancy right. in nature, too. And if like a gene already exists to make a certain compound, and if that compound is successful in a lot of other plants, you'll see that a lot of plants produced that compound because it's easy to make, requires low energy, you know, and there's a lot of utility in producing whatever that molecule is that it's producing. Yeah. And evolution so often is an efficiency exercise. It's about who can do the same thing or something better with less energy. And so when evolution stumbles upon a great adaptation, um, you will oftentimes see that then just spread like wildfire through the phylogeny among all of the ancestors of that individual, you know, that, that group, that little population or that individual, all of its ancestors now have that trait because it's so highly beneficial. And so I, there was a really neat paper that I was reading about the evolution of venom. And it looked across the animal kingdom and found that venom had evolved 101 separate times in animals. It's one of the most, I didn't realize, I hadn't thought about it. It's one of the most highly convergent traits in the entire animal kingdom. It's evolved 101 independent times convergently um, among animals. Wow, but what's I so did cool not know that. I didn't know it either, honestly. I knew it was just out there, but I hadn't, didn't realize there were so many independent evolutionary origins of venom. I kind of thought it was it would evolve here and be in all of these groups, but no, it was actually it evolved yeah, here. Yeah, like you think it'd be here, like here, here, like here. the snakes yeah. and like the spiders or something. You'd right. think it'd be like isolated to these certain families or whatever, but I wouldn't expect it to right. be like super widespread. Yeah, no, and you have like I think something like a dozen independent origins of venom just in the venomous snakes. They have come up with like almost a dozen different ways to do to do venom. Um, now, there are a lot of similar sort of, they've, they've stumbled a lot of, along, uh, along some really similar molecules, um, but they're still getting there convergently, that independently of each other, different lineages of snakes found it advantageous to be venomous. And so you have the evolution of venom in independent snake lineages. Um, but then wow. you have things like, the, you have things like the nadarians, like the jellyfish and the sea anemones, where venom evolved one time in their ancient ancestor and all of them kept it because it was so highly beneficial yeah they're so like this is areas. awesome like you know, let's just, all right, use exactly. this we're keeping this, <laughs> this wow yeah. so that is really really cool mm -hmm. um i yeah again i didn't know that at all and so i mean Different animals can use venom for different purposes too, right? Mm. Like I, this was part Very of the so. video that you made, but also, I mean, I've read about this too. It's like they can either use it to like hunt like or to capture some sort of prey to make it paralyzed right. or whatever, or they could use it as a defense mechanism like, oh, something's trying to prey on me. A good thing I have all these all this venom I can just inject into it if it if it tries to come out. Is there is there another way that they develop venom or are those kind of the main reasons? So we have defensive venom and predatory venom are, are yeah. the probably the two main, like you said, the two main sort of um uh adaptive um components of venom are in defense of yourself and subduing and killing prey. But then you yeah. also have some really interesting and kind of funky groups like the platypus where you have males that have these venomous spurs that they use only in competition with each other. On their they elbows, right? They, en elbows. they envenomate, yeah. They envenomate each other competing for females and territory. And so you have this intraspecific 
venom function in just a, in a handful of species where they're using it against other individuals of their same species, not to eat them or necessarily kill them, but to outcompete them for something, usually females. <laughs> Man, you would think that they would be immune to their own venom. I don't know if that's a thing, but like... It absolutely is. And that's actually really interesting. And I don't know that anybody has really looked at how or why platypus are not... Uh, immune to their own venom because you do see that we do see that yeah. in some venomous snakes right so re um, rattlesnakes for example um, are immune to their own venom because as tiny little rattlesnake hatchlings they already have fully formed venom circulating through their bloodstream in very small doses so essentially they're dosing themselves from the time they hatch they are being dosed with small amounts of their own venom which just like a you know when we get a vaccine or something produces antibodies to protect the body from that substance these antibodies bind to the venom rendering it more or less useless in the rattlesnake's body so that by the time it's not very old rattlesnakes are full of these antibodies that will bind that will recognize their own venom anytime it makes it into the bloodstream bind it and make it useless essentially render it ineffective and it's People do that too, don't they? They do, called, right? People I think it's called them. self self yes. immunizing, <laughs> something like the SIing. Um, yeah, yeah. And you read about there's like some really famous cases of this where people haven't like injected themselves with like over a hundred and fifty different types of venoms, and you know it's actually it's really incredible. And then oftentimes these people have their own collection of like venomous snakes and stuff and then mm -hmm. when one of them accidentally like gets them they don't die because they have these antibodies right. already from essentially like micro dosing like injecting themselves with these specific venoms but also in cases like if if somebody gets if somebody gets bit by like a really rare venomous spider or something and a hospital can't find an anti-venom Sometimes it's these people that have SI'd for a long time, self -im -immun immunized. I can't say that word right now. Yeah. Anyway, SI'd for a long time, immunized um, for a long time. And they donate their blood that has these antibodies in them. And it saves other people that would not have been saved if you didn't have these random people that <laughs> that have injected yeah. themselves with venom for so long. It's incredible. Yeah, it's it it's the exact same process, right? Small doses of, of the, the non-self particles, whether it's venom or whatever it might be, and a healthy immune system starts to build up those antibodies to it so that the next time you're exposed, you don't have nearly as strong a reaction. And the next time and the next time, your reaction continues to decrease in a perfect scenario, in a perfect SI yeah, scenario. Yeah, in, right? <laughs> in a perfect scenario. Right? Yeah, this is uh, not we advice should probably to go do on that record. at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that we're not oh, geez. <laughs> Like, yeah, no, it's a bad idea for everyone. Right. Just don't yeah. don't do that. There's there's yeah, just not medical advice. Um also didn't like um like royalty used to do this in medieval times, like so that they couldn't get like poisoned by by like their enemies. They would like microdose poison so that maybe that this is I don't folklore. Know. This might be folklore. I don't know. There's, I have no facts to back this up right now. I'm yeah, just kind of talking from know. something that exists in my brain. But I used to, I have something in my brain that says that royalty, like back in medieval times, would self-dose themselves with poison so that they could not be poisoned by their enemies. So I'll look into that and then edit this portion of the podcast so I'm not yeah. spewing misinformation. Um, no worries. I'm interested channel. to see what you find out for sure. Because that's really interesting. <laughs> and it makes sense, again, just from the what we know of the adaptive, the, the, the way that the body's immune system adapt, responds adaptively to non-self particles, um, again, whether it's venom or anything else, um, that actually makes sense that small, small amounts of, of poison or toxin over time could help you build up an immunity to them. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's actually a great point because, you know, I was reading a while ago in one of these uh, venom books that I have that, um, you know, your body in theory would be able to fight off any like venom essentially but because the mm. venoms work so fast your body's b cells just don't have enough time right. to produce those antibodies and to produce that immunity so unfortunately you do die but that led to the entire field of anti-venomics i think that actually might be an omics um field yeah. now which is yeah. a really incredible field um I, have you heard of like how the first 
uh, anti venoms were ever produced or like you know um, I actually what... haven't I don't know how the so, first anti venoms were produced. Well, it's it's like very similar to just vaccines in general. Okay. They they use horses as these like essentially right. machines to produce a serum that has a lot of antibodies right. in it. So they give the horse like a tiny bit of venom, not enough to kill it, just enough for that venom to be introduced into the into the horse's bloodstream and then the horse is producing antibodies against that venom and then a couple weeks later, those um, doctors, researchers, whatever they are, just harvest a bunch of horse blood. And then, you know, they they take the serum out. But this kind of leads to another issue, which is um, for a long time, they weren't able to purify that well enough. So then there's a bunch of horse proteins that are injected into humans. And then their immune system goes nuts because now you got a bunch right. of horse proteins and venom of inside of you, which is a huge problem. <laughs> And I can only imagine, and I, this, I may be speaking out of class here because it could be two totally different proteins, but I can only imagine the potential side effects, deleterious side effects of injecting someone who might be allergic to horses. I'm just thinking my son is really allergic to horses. Um, oh. But, you know, just the thought of injecting specific horse proteins into the bloodstream as opposed to, you know, just the reaction these the, the people tend to get, which usually is pretty, horse allergies usually are pretty severe, you know, lots of skin breaking out and stuff and, and irritation. So I can only imagine if someone who had a horse allergy was injected with horse proteins, how deadly that could potentially be. I think that uh, could be I, pretty I, bad. That, that probably horrible. would be on par with the venom as far as you're right which most, ones, def most which definitely. ones worse for you yeah probably i think, best uh, I think right and i think venom <laughs> science has come a lot further since then that i think they right. can actually like purify out uh what they need to but um mm. you know i'm not a venomologist so no. i don't know that for sure but i know it's a lot safer than it used to be um but i think something really cool too about these different animals that produce venom is that some animals also have learned to kind of not be affected by the venom. And that's yeah. that that kind of shows the power of co-evolution, too. So I don't it know if, really you've, if you yeah, if, if you have like an example there. I mean, I could think of an example, too, but like co-evolution in general, we see examples like all around us, but sometimes we don't even think of it as a product of co-evolution. Right. And I love the just thinking of coevolution when it comes to like predator prey or even between the sexes, males and females. In evolutionary biology, we talk a lot about these coevolutionary arms races, you know, where as the gazelle gets faster, as, as the gazelle's legs get a little longer, and that's the adaptation for running speed. In order to keep up, the cheetah's legs have to get a little longer, or their tail has to get a little long, longer in order to be that incredible rudder when they're going 65 miles an hour. And so you have this wow. co-evolutionary arms race between the prey and the predator getting faster and faster and faster and faster until honestly you will reach like some biomechanical limit to just literally how fast like the body can move um, under its own power. You know, as opposed to like a peregrine yeah. falcon that adopts like essentially the perfectly aerodynamic, almost physics defying shape to reach speeds of 240 miles an hour. The fastest peregrine falcon ever recorded traveled 240 miles an hour in its dive. Like, blows my mind. That but again, is incredible. When we talk, yeah. When we talk about these incredible adaptations, oftentimes they're reflective of these really extreme co-evolutionary arms races where you need these extreme speeds, these extreme adaptations to either avoid the predator that's running almost as fast as you or to catch the prey that is running a little yeah. bit faster than you, you know? Um, and so we see the same thing in venom, uh, venom producing like snakes and those uh, animals like king snakes or mongoose that hunt venomous snakes oftentimes. And you're absolutely right, because when we look at these animals that are more or less immune to snake venom, what we see is that this is very much evolutionary. This isn't a this isn't something that's acquired during their lifetimes, like in little rattlesnakes that are exposed chronically to small amounts of their own venom right, right. and build up immunity to it. The a mongoose or a king snake is born with it. And so that's an evolutionary adaptation that's passed on from their parents to them. and They'll pass on to their offspring. And what's really cool is what we see is in most of the species that are immune to venoms, instead of a slow buildup of antibodies, what they've got are enzymes that have specifically evolved to capture venom molecules, 
literally bind. And enzymes are just specialized proteins that will facilitate chemical reactions, right? And so they're just cruising around through the bloodstream of a, of a mongoose. Um, and when it gets bit, they their only job is to identify and bind to those venom molecules as fast as possible. So a mongoose, when it gets bit by a cobra, will usually look a little sick, but it usually won't die because the venom will start to act, but pretty quickly after the venom starts acting, it's, it's, be, it's being bound. Um, and so that mongoose might lay there and eat a cobra while feeling pretty sick, but it's not yeah, a little die from sick, the but he still, <laughs> still gets so, dinner, so he's happy. Yeah, right. And we have this really cool example of these coevolutionary arms races because what we see is in areas where cobras are heavily hunted by mongoose, the actual proteins in their venom are evolving to try to evade the receptors on the enzymes of the mongoose. Because if you think about it, the cobra is trying to avoid, avoid being killed by the mongoose. And the best way to do that is to kill the mongoose. But the only way you can kill the mongoose is if all the venom you inject doesn't get bound by these enzymes. And really, the only way you can do that is to have venom that is just slightly molecularly changed so that the enzyme can't wow. bind it before the mongoose dies. Um, so you get this wow. coevolutionary arms race between venom and venom resistance that just keeps ratcheting up or diversifying, right? Just different molecules are used, but it's just awesome to watch these. Well, that's another arms really races. cool thing about venom is we talk a lot in like when we study nature and like the different molecules that like the cannabis plant makes and this, this huge diversity of molecules. Um, but venom is also really, really diverse. Like it's not just one single molecule that they're just injecting into, um, you know, but their prey species or whatever, and it's killing them. It's actually like a cocktail of a bunch of different molecules. And they've found that similar to natural products, one single molecule from that venom is not potent enough to kill most things. It actually right. needs that synergistic effect of having multiple of those compounds present in order to like actually get the job done and what that venom's supposed to do, which I find amazing. And it's another great example of like the purpose of redundancy and chemodiversity and having yeah. all of these molecules present. And another really cool thing about how venom works, I, I love the example of the mongoose. And I know there's, um, I forget what animal it is, but there's one animal too, and probably more than one animal, where the actual receptor that the, that the toxin or the, yeah, what the toxin binds to, what the venom binds to, the receptor has been mutated in a way so that mm. the venom cannot bind to the receptor anymore, which is right. so cool. And it's another way like an animal could evade that, that toxin like being killed essentially by that venom is because the toxin literally can no longer bind to that receptor because it's evolved to get around it, which is so cool. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you're exactly right. And I think that's happening in the mongoose as well. I think the mongoose has both that those oh, circulating it, I think it does have both. But I think, yeah. you're, I think you're exactly right. I think that the acetyl, acetylcholine receptors in the brain, right? So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that, that communicates between neurons, right? Between these neurons that are trying to send a signal to the brain or from the brain to the muscles or wherever. Acetylcholine yes. is one of the neurotransmitter chemicals that crosses that barrier and communicates between neurons. And my understanding is that some Chem some uh, venoms bind to those acetylcholine receptors, which is what causes paralysis and eventually death in prey. That's exactly yeah. it, because that, that receptor is involved in the muscle contracting response. So Bingo. that's how they normally make their uh, prey paralyzed, because if you have a venom that binds to this, then they just are paralyzed and then they can eat their, their prey. So that's exactly, exactly There's it. no communication between neurons, and literally there is thus no function of the muscles of the you can't move your body if you're not if acetylcholine isn't passing between neurons because the muscles never get the signal from the brain move <laughs> do something the, uh, the 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 receptor the receptor on those neurons the acetylcholine receptor in mongoose mongoose has been modified to the point where it still binds its own acetylcholine but will no longer bind the cobra venom that's trying yes, to keep acetylcholine it's... from yeah I think it's five amino acids different, if I remember awesome. correctly. It's less than 10 amino acids different 
um, than like what the normal receptor would be. So it's so, so similar as what you're saying. Right. It can still bind acetylcholine or that yeah. or that animal wouldn't be able to survive. It can still bind that molecule, but it cannot bind cobra venom, which is right. so cool. And that's that's a really fun thing to think about that you could, if you don't have the receptors to bind cobra venom, you could get bit by a cobra and other than the bite itself, right. you wouldn't necessarily feel any ill effects, uh, at least from that one venom molecule, because it yeah. quite literally can't bind to the receptors that it needs to bind to to have the physiological effects in you or the prey or whatever it might be. So yeah. if, if, it's not, if it doesn't bind, it doesn't do anything. And this actually brings us to one of the questions I have from one of our listeners. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase because it's just going to be part of a conversation here. But essentially, yeah. do you think you would be able to either, this is where I'm modifying the question, take that gene for that specific like acetylcholine modified receptor mm. and put it in a different animal? Or do you think you could also take a gene to make a venom and put that into an animal that doesn't normally produce venom and make it produce yeah. venom? <laughs> so my guess, my guess, and maybe with the acetylcholine receptors, it could be a single gene. You were saying it's just a few amino acid substitutions. So it could just be a single gene that controls the molecular configuration of that receptor. And if it is, then in theory, it would be pretty straightforward if we've, if we've identified that gene to try splicing it into another organism, see whether that confers some level of immunity to that venom. So I will say, yes, theoretically, that's possible. We've done much more complicated things with True. more genes than, than one. So it's possible. Um, and then in the other direction, you know, if we if again, if like venom production is a controlled by a single gene, which it probably isn't, especially given as I love that term you used chemo diversity, right? Chemical, yeah, diversity, chemical chemo diversity. diversity. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Chemo diversity. That's a great term. Um, but because of the sort of chemo diverse nature of, of venoms, I think that trying to make like a non venomous species venomous by gene substitution, I think we're probably playing with a lot more genes there that are oh, going to have right. some potentially confounding they, effects. They would just kill themselves immediately if you didn't put both of it, those together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd all need all sorts of stuff. You need like yeah. the venom delivery system and the venom, you know, like the venom sacs, the organs. Um, so, you know, not only would we, I think, I think the likelihood of like a gene substitute leaning, leading to immunity is more likely than us being able to like take genes from a venomous animal and making a non venomous animal venomous because of all yeah. the things you're saying, you know, you literally I need think, an yeah. organ in which to store the venom. So it's not just circulating. You need some venom delivery system, like a stinger or fangs or something. And so which, that requires all sorts of morphological adaptations. And that also uh, brings the really good point of the difference between a venom and like a poison is you're yeah. talking about venom delivery system. So like venom right. has to be injected. That's it's that's delivered. what makes a venom a venom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's delivered. Yep. Whereas yep. like a poison is like if you eat something that kills you, you were poisoned right. by that substance. Yep. Poisons are ingested, right? And yes. venoms are injected is, is kind of a, uh, an easy, just one yeah, sentence. Yeah, that's a nice, nice way to works, simplify right? it. I like yep. that. Yep. Very cool. And so it's not just mong mongoose is the plural of mongoose is that i'm gonna say maybe mon mon <laughs> is it mongoose mongooses Gooses? or mongoose i don't know we'll go with mongoose i think that sounds nice it makes sense <laughs> so mongoose aren't the only ones that pr are immune to venom either i know i've read about like badgers some skunks some cat species but i think my mm. favorite thing i ever read about was some researchers somewhere where they had um they were like doing experiments on venomous snakes and they like bought these um i think it's called like a texas rat or what i'll have to put that in the show notes some sort of yeah. special rat they just like got on sure. sale or whatever it was cheap it was affordable so they fed it to the the venomous snake and the snake was not able to kill it. And in some cases, the rat actually killed the snake by like, you know, mm. biting it and scratching it. And that's how they found out that that species of rat can't be killed by the specific venomous snake because it just 
in the laboratory just happened to be like the perfect experiment by accident, which I think is I you know, so it. interesting. Yeah. Accidental experiments are some of the best, right? Right. I think so too. I'm, I'm going to find the name of this rat. Texas wood yeah. rat. That's the name Texas of it. Texas wood rats. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I'm a, I am familiar with them. I did my, uh, a three year national institutes of health, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at Texas A&M, Texas A&M university in Whoa. college state. Uh, got to know, I actually did know some, some folks who were working on wood rats, but more in ecological context than in a sort of venom, anti-venom resistant evolution context. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So you lived in Texas for a while. That must have been. I did. Where do you yeah, live I've now? Got my... Uh, so I'm in Spokane, Washington, which is my hometown. So I'm from Spokane, and I got my PhD, uh, my undergrad at the University of Montana. Then I went off to the University of Maryland for my PhD, did that postdoctoral fellowship, and then landed a professorship up here in Spokane after that. Wow. So you were you were like all over the U.S. and then I did. I got to travel home. quite a bit for school. I feel really privileged. Like I, I as a kid who who just was growing up looking at national geographic and like mutual of omaha's wild kingdom was like the only nature show on tv at the time oh, and yeah. marty stauffer's marty stauffer's wild america you know um it's just it was something that just kind of crystallized in me that i just wanted to know so much more about these animals in far off places and how someone gets to go to places like australia and these incredible places to study these incredible animals and so to have the opportunity to do it, because um, my PhD, even though it was at University of Maryland, I did all my field work in Australia, um, was just a dream Whoa. come true. I mean, a dream come true. I, I, yeah, I still just get like this amazing feeling when I just think about like how lucky I was to be able to somehow manage it that I did to go to a far off place and study some of the coolest creatures on the planet. I just no for feel real. Really that's like yeah. that's so. Were you there like? Would you like collect a bunch of data and like stuff in Australia and stay there for a while and then you'd come back yep. and, you know, do additional research and laboratory studies and then go back and forth? Yeah, exactly. So for the first four years I was at the University of Maryland for my PhD, I never saw the fall. I never saw the leaves turn in Maryland until my fifth year because wow. September through December, every year for those first four was field work in northern New South Wales, Australia. So yeah, exactly that. We'd go, we'd be early, we'd be catching tons of birds, th literally thousands of birds, morphometric measurements, blood samples, putting little colored leg bands on their legs so we could identify them during the mating season so we'd know who was mating with whom and all of that. And then we'd stay for another two months and literally just monitor this population of satin bower birds throughout the mating season, come home in January, and then that spring would just be an absolute uh, whirlwind of data collection or yeah, looking at the data we collected, yeah. watching thousands of hours of, of video that we collected, as well as taking classes. So spring was nuts for me and during my PhD. Absolutely crazy. That is so, so cool. And like Australians in general are like a different breed as far as their relationship with like poisonous and venomous things. At least that's how I they like really interpret are. it. It's, they seem like amazing that they're just like, they're not fearful of what's out there because yeah. there's so no. many different things that can kill you in Australia. It's Right. I mean, I mean yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's crazy the way that, you know, we would get all of these, we get these volunteer field assistants and, you know, thank you. If you're out there and you were one of my volunteer field assistants, thank you so much. Like we ask so much of our volunteer field assistants because that's really grueling four months out there and they, they, Without them, we literally couldn't have done what we do. But most of them were from America, even though we were going all the way to Australia. And we always advertised internationally. The vast majority of our field crew would come from the States. Gotcha. And we have our own relationship and like opinions on venomous animals. And it's pretty negative, right? <laughs> like they are things to be to run from. Whereas Australia's uh, Australians, you know, the ones that I got to know, they seem to have absolutely zero fear of these venomous animals. And I think right. it's just because that is a part of daily life. You know, you've got a funnel web spider in the garden, you've got a red belly black snake under your porch, and you got a brown, a semi aggressive brown snake in the, in, you know, in the corner of the yard. So they're dealing with these venomous animals all the time. Um, a friend of mine had a great story of a friend of his who got bit by a red belly black snake and on his way to the clinic changed a flat tire for a person who'd broken down on the side of the road. You know? And he still made oh the clinic God. just some swelling on his arm, you know, and was none the worse for wear. But I love uh, again, that, don't though. recommend that. But yeah, Right, right, right. Don't do that. <laughs> Not medical advice. Again. Go straight to the clinic. 
if you get bit but, by a bit of a snake, go straight to the clinic. Literally, every time. Um, I think it's cool, though, because I feel like, at least in America, our intolerance for wildlife and for things that can be dangerous is, like, so high. It's like, we think we're, like, the rulers of the world and everything else has to, that could potentially harm us needs to like get out of the way. And I feel like yeah. Australians are just like, let's coexist among these things and all just be educated on the things that can kill us and just live among them smartly. And I think that's very admirable because I can never see that happening in America. If we had so many deadly things, I feel like we would have made them all extinct by now because yeah. we're scared of them. And that's how we deal with our problems is we just hit delete and, move on. Yeah. I mean, look at the way we've treated predators in North America over the years, yeah. right? We've driven so many predators to extinction or now they're only found in small pockets and fragmented habitat, you know, um, and, and, and to, now to be, to be clear, Australians still have that sort of, you know, colonizer sort of attitude towards nature. I mean, there is, there's definitely a, a, it's a human you know, thing. It's, it's a huge. human thing. There's definitely a, you know, nature is here to be sort of, you know, mastered and, and as opposed to like worked with. But, yeah. you know, I don't want to generalize, obviously, an entire continent. Um, but they do have their own struggles with, you know, their relationships with wildlife. I know right now there's a real debate raging in Australia about the dingoes. Um, and there's a pretty big push to eradicate them, whereas there's a big counter push now that hadn't really existed for very long to, to recognize dingoes as a natural and native part of the ecosystem as much as people like to try to paint them as these non-native dogs they're just they're native they've been around that they've been in australia for sixty thousand years or more so um but again they they still have a bit of that sort of um mentality of you know predators bad predators bad predators bad um oh yeah that, we, uh, that we, we that we need to get past if we're going to have a healthy relationship with the ecosystems around us a hundred percent. And we can't pick and choose what we're tolerant for, whether it's like right. cute or not, or like, so I, I mean, we see, we see this all the time, like around where we are, especially with something like black bears, like, mm. yeah, they do like, you know, people will post, Oh my God, there was this bear in my backyard. It's, you know, getting into my bird feeder. And I'm like, well, mostly, I mean, my husband's a wildlife biologist and he's like, you built a house on in, in his backyard that's where the bear right. lives and then yep. you essentially hung up a giant donut in front of it which is a bird feeder and said okay don't touch this don't come to this my property bear you're not allowed to come up here and you know touch this bird feeder it just yeah the the tolerance for wildlife is is pretty sad but we can move on from yep. that um sure. i would <laughs> I, I would love to also talk about uh, the ways that like venoms can be beneficial to us um, as medicines, because most bioactive substances, like if we find that they are active in our bodies and maybe they do kill us, maybe that's just the wrong dose. The dose determines right. the poison, right? So um, a lot of researchers for many different types of venom have found that if you just lower that uh, you know, that venom load quite a bit, you know, maybe a thousand, five thousand fold. Um, there's actually therapeutic medicinal effects from super low doses of uh, these venom. So yeah. I would love to hear what you've read about this, because it's it's a really, really interesting field of medicine that I think a lot of people thought we were never going to get to. Um, but it really has saved a lot of people's lives. Yeah, and that's just so cool because it gets back to a little bit of what you were talking about, that chemo diversity. So some venoms, there are a couple of species of, of uh, venomous snakes whose venoms have been used for multiple um, medicinal purposes. Different molecules are just active in different ways that we have then discovered are hugely beneficial to us. So venoms, literally venoms now are being, and, or I shouldn't say the venom itself, but aspects, molecules within yeah. venoms are now being used for everything from like chronic pain to diabetes um, inflammatory diseases, all sorts of things that you wouldn't necessarily expect that a molecule that quite literally evolved, or at least in these species that use it as venom, evolved to kill <laughs> or paralyze, yeah. somehow totally disable, usually another animal that in small purified doses that these molecules can actually act to quite literally improve and save lives is mind-blowing, right? Mind-blowing. That the same molecule in a different dose in a different animal that kills one 
can essentially save another. I mean, that's just, right. I it's love It's mind that. blowing. But at yeah. the same time, like we're just talking about how like a certain venom binds to a nicotinic acetylcholine re- receptor. Just, I mean, pretty similar to how like nicotine does. I mean, not, not similar binding, but like that interaction is Most relatively definitely. similar and it's relatively specific too, which is what we're looking for in a drug, like for something to be predictable specific and safe and maybe that Mm. safety window is much smaller for something like a venom but because it's bioactive and because it's specific and because it acts on mammalian receptors it can be it can be a drug which is astonishing right right yeah all of the like the the framework is there we just have to be able to identify the structures that we're playing with that are active in this system um, for us to know how we can take advantage of a system that evolved over you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years um, for use in just present day acute treatment. And that's just so cool. I, I just have so much admiration for folks, for scientists doing that work, isolating these individual proteins, these peptides, and, and trying to understand their, not only their function in sort of their evolution ecology, but okay, how does this then, because like you were saying, we have the same receptors. And so yeah. how does this then, you know, affect us in various doses? And yeah, we're discovering that a lot of these molecules are very much beneficial to us if we can just figure out the dose because we already have yes. the receptors. They'll bind exactly. to us. Exactly. And Whoa. um so there there was definitely a drug um from the venom of the Gila monster. Um, yes. Which, if, if you don't know what the Gila monster looks like, I'll put a picture on the YouTube video because I think they're adorable. Um, but me let too. me see. This drug was called Bietta. That's what the drug yes. was called. And it stimulates insin- insulin release, but only when you have high blood pressure, which is really, really cool because other drugs uh, weren't that um, selective. It wasn't only when you had blood pressure, it was kind of always. So it could get kind of dangerous because you could become hypoglycemic or be, you know, you have too much insulin at some point if you aren't able to regulate that. But the venom from the Gila monster essentially created this amazing drug that worked in a way on these GLP-1, uh, you know, receptors in our bodies that can help diabetics in a way that no other drug we've ever produced has been able to act in the body. And like, that is incredible. It really is. You know, and that's the other thing is some, I think a lot of the, the science that's working with some of these molecules is really just trying to figure out how these different molecules would interact with the human physiology when they come, when and if they came into contact with it. And, uh, and that's, it is absolutely fascinating because who would have thought that something in the saliva, a protein in the saliva, I, I think it's probably a protein in the saliva of Gila monsters yeah. has an effect on insulin levels in humans, right? And yeah, can be used as a diabetes <laughs> drug, right? No, <laughs> and that's just it. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I just have so much admiration for the chemists who are doing that work, who are identifying these molecules and saying, OK, so there is a, a really similar molecule in us. And so if we use this molecule in humans, how does that you know, affect this signaling system? Just incredibly cool science. Yeah. And I mean, that kind of just shows that, like, you know, all mammals aren't that different because we do have similar Absolutely. receptors and like these compounds can bind to us and cause some sort of effect. And, you know, I hope that they weren't using that, that Texas rat when they were doing any of these studies or right. <laughs> that, could no, have, seriously. that could have been bad, <laughs> but I'm sure they weren't. I'm sure they were right. using, you know, mouse models, but it's yeah, still just interesting. You accidentally test your like volatile chemical in an animal that's immune to it. And you're like, Oh look, it's harmless. <laughs> move no. to clinical trials. Right. Move to clinical trials. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that would be a disaster. Um, that could be a sci-fi book at that point. Oh, yeah. I mean, I I find just co-evolution in general so cool. And, you know, I think a lot of people who really like learning about drugs and about even like even recreational drugs and trying to learn like how these different compounds interact with the body. I think you'll also really love like diving into the world of poisons and toxins. I I would totally agree. I have a poisonous plant garden at home and everyone's like, that's so like weird. Are you trying to kill people? I'm like, I'm not trying to kill people, but like, it's really cool to have these beautiful different flowers and even like the morphology of the flower and the color of the flower and the different parts of the flower that produce these different, you know, poisons. 
I think it's amazing to be able to visually see that and then, you know, be able to also, you know, extract it if you wanted to, which I don't usually do. Sure. Um, but it it is incredible how beautiful these plants usually are. Like they they usually have this like this flower that looks like it produces poisons. It's like, yeah. mm, you don't want to eat me, dude. You do not want to eat me. And it's like, yeah, you have pointy petals and, you know, you're black in color. What does that mean? Or you're like red in color. Or like the, the castor bean, um, which it produces ricin. Um, right. It is beautiful. It looks like <laughs> a beetle. It has this like crazy pattern on it. And it's like... That's the part of the plant that produces the poison is the part right. that looks like a poisonous beetle. Like it's so right. interesting to, to draw that connection. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And it's, it's like when you have poison in you, you know, because you're as a plant, you're trying to avoid either being eaten or the part that has like the seed. I'm just again thinking of like apples or peaches, you know, the seed, the pit. It's not meant to be eaten. So it's packed with poison but it's wrapped in this delicious outside, you know, this delicious fruit that's quite literally evolved to be eaten. Um, and so it's just really interesting to think about how plants have evolved to communicate with, uh, with animals, right? I mean, we all know that we take that for granted in sort of like pollination and things like that. The flowers attract pollinators. So, so obviously there's a communication system there, but there's also a communication system among plants with set telling organisms not to eat them. Like if you bite oh, me, 100%. you will get sick, right? And exactly. so it's just, it's so cool that we can look at those plants and say, yeah, that's a poisonous plant. I can tell that's a poison. It's communicating to me <laughs> that that is a poisonous not to eat it. And that's yeah, just so and cool. And the castor pod that houses those um, seeds, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it is literally bright, yeah. bright red and spiky. Like it's, it's this big, bright red and just spiky. And you're like, oh, right. yeah, that would be a poisonous thing. And there's right. whatever it is, like, of course. Yes. But even like, even if it's not something that directly kills something that eats it, it could also just like taste like shit. Like it could be Absolutely. really bitter. It could be sour. It could just be something that if a if a monkey or something was eating a fruit and it ate all that, you know, delicious stuff around it, and then it got to the seed and it was like, oh, I don't want to eat that anymore. That, that tastes really bad compared to the rest of the fruit. Like that's another signal that doesn't have to kill the monkey, but it can tell the monkey like, yo, you should not touch this portion because this is the part that has my genes in it. And I need to keep that around. Absolutely. And like, even if they're not brightly colored, like a bulb, like an onion underground and an most animals aren't going to start eating an onion and choose to continue. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just we we buy like a slice of onion on our sandwiches, but not a lot of animals, other than some larva of some insects that I'm familiar with, will just eat an onion. And so again, yeah. it just it speaks to those chemicals in the onion that we enjoy as flavors, playing this really important role, not only in making the soil around them as they leach out, sort of inhospitable to competition, but also to any herbivore that takes a chance on biting an onion, probably isn't going to finish it, probably isn't going to eat the onions around it. And so, yeah, you have these chemicals that act on a number of different levels. Yeah, again, that chemo diversity you were talking about is really exactly. neat. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, that those volatiles, too, mm. that animal probably remembers just the smell. So next right. time that it encounters an onion, it doesn't even need to damage the onion. It doesn't totally. even need to taste the onion. It just knows from the smell and from those molecules being around it that that's going to taste bad. So I'm just going to avoid that altogether. And that's what some animals have learned to do is to like copy what other plants and stuff have done. Like they're like, oh, well, the onion made this and it worked for it. So I'm going to make something really similar. Or like if it was a, a poisonous butterfly or something, you have this really poisonous butterfly and it has these crazy patterns on it. So then a similar moth or something close by says, well, that butterfly is not getting eaten, so I'm going to put some cool pattern on me. And it's not even poisonous. It's not even, you know, toxic to whatever right. eats it. But it's biomimicry. That's what it's called. So then the moth now just mimicked what the butterfly had adapted to do to tell everyone that it's poisonous. But it's not even poisonous. It's just like, yeah, right. I, I read the book on butterflies and I decided to be a butterfly and it works. 
Yeah, that's exactly. one of my all-time favorite stories, honestly, is that that form of mimicry where you have a non-toxic species mimicking the look or the behavior of a toxic species. And the classic example of that, and I think you were alluding to it, is the monarch bite butterfly and the viceroy. So the, the monarch butterfly that's is it. I didn't know the other name of the other yeah. one. <laughs> the beautiful black and black and, and orange butterfly that we have all up and down the west coast of, of North America. And... Um, and their color advertises the fact that they're toxic. They are really distasteful because their caterpillars are munching on milkweed, which produces those alkaloids that are designed to keep, honestly, to keep caterpillars from munching on it. But monarch caterpillars love milkweed. But it so doesn't they, work they, and they, they just accumulate yeah, it all they in there. Right. They sequester yeah. these toxins right into the, their tissues. And so when they metamorphose into a butterfly, the butterfly, the monarch butterfly is really distasteful. And one of my favorite things, you were talking about how animals would learn that the onion's distasteful. Predators have to learn that yeah. monarch butterflies don't taste good. And there's some really classic, and I show all of my students, blue jays throwing up after eating monarch <laughs> butterflies because it just gets the point across. It literally, I've got a series of photos that show blue jays eating monarchs and then vomiting. You just like I've never seen a bird later. vomit. I need yeah. to I need to pull up this video after. This sounds it's amazing. Not, unfortunately, it's not a video. It's just oh, it's, it's, just okay. Still, it's okay. But it's still it's still cool to look at. Yeah, blue jays vomiting monarch butterfly. You'll you'll find it. I'll, <laughs> um, I'll because, find it. But the point is just like that. They have to learn, right? A blue jay isn't doesn't hatch knowing a monarch butterfly's coloration. That intense black and orange color indicates their toxicity. They have to learn it. And so where that benefits the viceroy butterfly, the non-toxic mimic of a monarch, mm. is that every blue jay that eats a monarch and throws up and is like, okay, I'm going to avoid black and orange <laughs> okay. butterflies, also avoids viceroys, even though viceroys are harmless. So viceroys have evolved to take advantage of the toxicity of their cousin, the monarch, even though they themselves are not toxic, which I just think is That's, awesome. It requires predator such- learning. And it's, it is a really cool example. And like that example, like a similar example exists in almost all walks of life. Like doesn't the coral snake, like, isn't there one that looks really similar to that one? I don't know any of the actual names of these animals. I just know what they look like in my head. Um, But it's, it's just really cool that animals have learned from other animals and from the, the predator prey relationship of other animals, what colors to display to stay out of trouble and prevent themselves from getting eaten. It's really right. cool. Right. I totally <laughs> and you agree. you have butterflies behind you too, which is I awesome. do. Yeah. I, I kind of surround myself with butterflies. I, I find them, they blow my mind. So when, when you, when you talk to somebody who's just into animal communication and bright sexual selection, bright colors, stuff like that. I mean, you can't avoid butterflies, right? You're just right in the middle of them. What's your favorite butterfly? So the morphos are my favorite. The big blue butterflies of Central South okay. America. Oh my gosh. I had never seen a blue morpho in the wild until I was doing my postdoctoral stuff uh, at Texas A&M. And we would go down to Mexico to collect, uh, to study these little fishes in which I was investigating the evolution of mate choice and visual uh, sensory systems and how that played a role in which males females found attractive. So I was literally looking at eyes and and photoreceptors and and mate choice and things like that. But we would go down there and I remember the first time we were on this little river in the mountains of the Sierra Madre Oriental of Mexico and I saw this what looked like just blue tin foil, like next to the river. And I thought to myself, no way, like no way, I'm gonna see a morpho. And I walk up down to the river and it's just this massive blue morpho. I don't know the species very well. And I mean, I still, wow. I literally have chills right now telling this story because my mind was so blown. You know, I just, I sat there and marveled at, and there were all these other butterflies, all these yellow ones and swallowtails. It was just a magical moment. It was one of those perfect moments for me. And I'm just sitting wow. there just just taking in this massive reflective blue butterfly just thinking, yeah, I'm pretty lucky. <laughs> I'm pretty lucky to be here right now because this Definitely. this is one of those moments I'm going to keep with me for forever. Yeah. So yeah, yeah the blue I mean... morphos <laughs> are my favorite butterflies in general, but my favorite local butterflies that I have like regular interactions with are definitely the tiger swallowtails. They're a massive yellow swallowtail butterfly we get here in the pacific northwest okay okay and they're just they're just awesome they're like four and a half inches across big Whoa. long tails they have these big long streamers on their on their wings their, their hind wings beautiful beautiful um uh butterflies and so yeah i've 
I've been around them since I was little because I grew up here in eastern Washington. And so, yeah, they're they have a special place in my heart for sure. That's really cool. I, I have a friend up. I live in New Hampshire. I have a friend up here by me. Shout out to Carly. Um, she's like single handedly trying to um, reintroduce like monarch butterflies, not even reintroduce, but just to keep the population alive up here because yeah. there's so few and it's really not a thriving population. And like you will literally find her on the side of the road flipping milkweed leaves over looking for these these small little caterpillars yeah. and then yeah. she'll bring them home and she'll raise them until they're you know ready to be butterflies and then she'll release them in like a you know safe area and she's just like that's her passion she's all about it. it and i'm like i love i love this for you and it's so fun to watch her like thriving with butterflies i you know people who are passionate about the natural world around us i just i gravitate to those people i just Me want too. to be around them i want to learn from them I want to carry their stuff if they need me to carry something when we're going into the field. Like I just, I just like being around those people who have a passion for nature and preservation and conservation. It's just, uh, oh yeah, my yeah, kind of people. <laughs> I agree. She's incredible, and like she, she's a great communicator about it, and I, I just respect her a lot. And I mean, we're kind of getting towards the end here, and I want to yeah. make sure you also have plenty of time to talk about like. If somebody wanted to become an evolutionary biologist and like they, they maybe they want to do field work in Australia and they want to mm -hmm. research butterflies and they want to do like really cool stuff. Like, do you have any suggestions on, you know, where they should go, like from where they're at? Should they, you know, apply to college or should they do an internship yeah. or should they read some really cool books and then figure <laughs> out from there? Like, do you have any advice for people? Honestly, I would say all of the above. Right. So yeah. everybody's different and everybody's path to where they want to get is different. Um, you have to start with a passion. Like you just want yeah. to know so much more about something. And for me, like I said, I just I wanted to know more about elaborate songs and bright colors and these weapons, you know, that are the product of evolution by sexual selection. And so I ended up in a Ph.D. program, literally studying sexual selection and mate choice. Um, but the way to, that I think to get there is, again, just to remind you, there isn't a single way to get there. Um, yeah. I tell a lot of my students, including my own kids, um, you know, don't don't feel like you're in a rush unless you know exactly what you want to do out of high school. We have some great community colleges right here around us. And so I talk to my students about, you know, the the, the benefits of, you know, getting your two year degree like an AA from a community college. And then after that, you know, then thinking about, do you want to take that financial step and that commitment step to a four year school? Um, huge, and commitment. Huge, huge commitment, huge commitment on, on a yeah. number of different, in a number of different ways, huge commitment. Obviously, if you do want to become, say, an evolutionary biologist per se, you are going to go on to get some advanced degrees. You know, you are yeah. going to go on and get your bachelor's in, in science, you know, biology, wildlife biology, whatever that might be, chemistry. Um, physics, all of those science-based backgrounds, you could easily get yourself into an evolutionary biology program. Um, but my, my biggest advice is if you decide that, that science is for you and you want to pursue science and you're going to just charge hard through academia and get, you know, go get, get yourself into that position, the best thing you can do as an undergrad and what worked really well for me, and I know a number of other friends of mine who were in grad, good grad programs, is as you're working through your undergraduate work, just pay attention in your classes. And when you come across animals or mechanisms, things that you find frickin' fascinating, you want to know more about, um, see who's out there working on those systems. So like, for example, in my, I was a junior at the University of Montana and in an animal behavior class, I was introduced to the bowerbirds. And the, the, if you're not familiar with bowerbirds, seriously, the coolest family of birds on the planet, the males build these stick structures on the ground called bowers where females show up for courtship and the male, you know, will, de will display various decorations on the bower platform. I mean, it's a fantastic system. So, cool. so it blew my mind. And so I'm thinking, I want to know more about bowerbirds. And so I, what I started doing was in my junior year, I started communicating, literally just sending an email out, cold turkey, you know, not cold turkey, but just cold, I don't know what that term is, but just sending them out without a an invitation yeah, to send, right? Yeah. yeah, I guess it's cold calling, but I'm not really like- Yeah, anyway. okay. <laughs> um, but I, the idea was just to let them know who I was 
that I'd come across their research and that I just thought it was really cool. And I'll be graduating in a year and a half. And I don't know where you're you're at in terms of like funding, because something to know, folks, if you're if you're going to go on to like a graduate program, the funding has to be there. Um, and so one of the things you want to make sure you ask of a potential advisor or the program itself is like, what are your funding schemes? You know, do each ind- does each individual advisor have to get their own grants, you know, through the NSF or National Institutes of Health or wherever it might be? And that then funds their graduate students. Does the school have a lot of teaching assistantships? You know, so through my PhD program, I taught for a couple of years. And then I was lucky enough to write some good, solid proposals and get some funding for the subsequent years of my PhD so that I was paid to essentially go to school, which is pretty cool. And those opportunities are out there. But my biggest recommendation is reach out to the people who are studying this in the systems that you find really interesting and just shoot your shot. Just say, hey, this is who I am. I love your research. I'm fascinated by it. And if you, even if you don't think you're going to go on to a PhD program, but you do want to just be one of, and I say just, even though you are vital, but you just yes. want to be like a volunteer field assistant, reach out to them with that, right? If there is nothing a professor will love more than hearing from you as a motivated, you know, easy to get along with undergrad or, or person who just thinks what they're working on is really cool and you're willing to help. Um, and if you want, if, if that's what you want to do with, you know, volunteer or field crew, send that email. If you want to go on to grad school and really study that organism or that mechanism, then write that email, right? Yes. I'm, a, I'm a junior at the University of Montana and I came across your research in an animal behavior class and I'm blown away. <clears throat> and I'd love to, to talk to you about potential grad student, you know, grad school opportunities. So that's my recommendation. Think, Shoot your I shot. Think, yeah, send that, that is like the best advice and i've said this like a million times it's like always send the email like never be like oh they're really you know they're really busy or i'm sure they get a lot of emails yeah they do get a lot of emails but like not as many as you think like about your specific interest and if you know i was a pi looking for a new undergraduate or graduate you know student researcher i would want the motivated student that reached out to me six months ago and said hey if you ever need somebody in your laboratory like choose me this is my background blah 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 and like showed interest i think that's the best and and that's not even like academia like i talk about this a lot even in the cannabis industry like if you want to learn how to do you know bho extraction reach out to somebody you know who does bho extraction and say hey i'm really interested in this line of work i'm not really sure you know what i'm doing would you mind if i shadowed you for a day or do you need any more lab techs in your laboratory or you know something like that just showing that you want to learn and that like you're willing to do the steps to get there but it's it you you're never going to regret sending the email. And honestly, exactly. if so, if someone doesn't reply, I would send another email. Like I would say, yep. hey, just following up to see if you received my first message. Because I completely agree. What's the worst thing? <laughs> what's the worst thing that can happen? They respond either. They don't respond to your second email, in which case you can probably move on. Or right, they respond right. and yeah, say, you know, good. right. Yeah. Or they respond and say, you know, right now I don't have funding. I don't have a space in my lab. But thank you so much for your interest in my research. You've lost nothing. You know, uh, exactly. and you might gain something really valuable um, in that uh, that communication. So, yeah, shoot, shoot, send that email. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I am not an evolutionary biologist, but I think something that myself and a lot of like people who are interested in nature, it's just like spend time observing things. Mm. And that can also kind of help spark your interest, whether you're you're in a city and you decide to go to the zoo or the botanical garden or something like that and you can observe things or you live in the country and you can go take a walk in the woods and you know observe nature in that way like there's nature all around us whether you're in a city or you're in the country but just taking the time out of your day to give it to nature and to give your attention to nature and try to observe something you've never observed before you would be amazed the layers of intricacies in literally every system that's around us it's like you can always learn something you can always learn something and in that one organism that one blade of grass or the spider in your corner there are probably dozens and dozens of like phd theses just waiting to be done on that spider on that grass you know on that flower um it's just a matter of of like you said starting with an observation and letting it grow into like a passion like a a question you're really passionate about something you want to know and then finding those 
those people, those organizations that are just doing work that you that that will help you get that answer to that question. Um, yeah, there are lots of opportunities out there. It's just a matter of knowing how to identify them, I think, and not being afraid to just put yourself out there. That is the hardest part with <laughs> like literally anything you do. Absolutely. Like even like, I mean, we're both social media people too. Like everyone's like, oh, you love social media. I could never. I'm like, oh no, I don't, I don't love doing don't. this at all. <laughs> yeah, no, like no. I, like I'm doing this because I think it benefits myself and our community a lot. And like, I understand how to do it, but I don't necessarily, you know, love doing it, but I understand that the pros outweigh the cons a lot. So right. I continue um, to do it. Yeah. And we love talking about science and the, the, the parts of science that, yeah, love that, that we're that we're interested in both professionally and personally. Um, and so it's something we enjoy. But social media per se. No, I do not enjoy social media. Well, right. If it was just <laughs> if it was just like if you well, for my perspective if i never had a video removed and i could just talk about the science of like <laughs> cannabis just openly like social media would be amazing even even right. with hate comments like it would be amazing oh, sure. um yeah. but that it's it's just not that simple right now uh, which is okay agreed. but whatever yeah. um speaking of social media where can people find your social media if they want to catch up on your channel and all the awesome information you're putting out yeah, so by far my my largest sort of presence online is going to be on TikTok, where I'm Chuck Darwin, just all one word, Chuck Darwin. Um, I am Chuck Darwin Science on both Instagram and YouTube. But if you do go find me there, you'll notice that most of both of those accounts are just some of my TikToks posted on those platforms. And there are a few different reasons for that. YouTube is just for me a whole different animal, and Instagram, I just have my issues with Meta. So I'll be honest, I, don't I blame love. You. I love producing you know, content for TikTok. As much as TikTok can frustrate me and the mods can really get, you know, especially because of, I talk oftentimes about sexual selection. And so even just some of the words I use, you know, I use biological anatomy terms that oftentimes will get my TikToks flagged. Um, oh, when they get taken down, I usually that. have, yeah. So I use, I use a lot of anatomy that gets, gets the moderator's attention or at least the auto moderator's attention. Um, so anyway, long story short, there are some frustrations with, you know, being a science communicator on TikTok, especially evolutionary biology, where you're just you're going to use words and terms that are going to sort of just trigger some people, um, even if it's just a giggle or something. But it gets the attention yeah. I think sometimes of the moderators um, and uh, and can kind of pull those TikToks in the wrong direction. But that yeah. said, I still <laughs> I really enjoy producing content for TikTok and I love my followers there. They ask the best questions. And so that's um, the thing. Yeah. And I, yeah, you, I you just can't it. explain that to like other people. But it's like, why do you like, you know, TikTok so much? And it's like this community like I cannot explain yeah. it like I feel like they know me and I know them and then I mean this sounds bad and sorry to anyone who only follows me on Instagram but I feel like I'm just kind of throwing it against the wall and just like leaving it on Instagram mm. like I yeah I don't feel like it's as much of a community it's more of like right there's I get more hate comments but it's also just like the, the same people and I understand that's also part of the algorithm because I can't be shown to the general public because my content is too dangerous so um mm, so it is much mm. more refined dangerous and heavy quotes here um right. but you know whatever but I I do really love TikTok however they design that algorithm and that community it's special yeah. it's really cool and especially for I science agree. communicators too like I've met so many science communicators on TikTok and like I, I find it such like a valuable resource because I can comment on your video and be like, yo, like this, this was such a cool video. Like, what about, you know, this thing? And then you can reply to my comment and then we can kind of go back and forth. Like, that's a really cool dialogue. That's a really it cool is. ability to communicate with other scientists that is just not possible on other platforms. I totally agree. And it's just so rewarding, too. And I know you see this, too, in your comment section when you just see people asking these really thoughtful questions that were generated by something you shared that we shared. And it's just it's meaningful. It's it was my favorite part of being a teacher up in front of students is when they would ask questions. And yet yeah. my students also my students also knew that if they could get if they asked the right question, they could get me off on a, an evolutionary <laughs> biology tangent and we wouldn't cover anything for the rest of the class. 
So it was always a bit of a challenge to try to gauge, okay, is that a question because they're genuinely curious about the material or are they trying to get me monologuing about like satin bowerbirds? Honestly, <laughs> relatable because one, I could talk to you forever about so many cool things. Like, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll definitely have to catch up in the future again. I'd love that. Um, love but it. yeah, and like, I agree. Like, I think that's kind of how teaching should be, though. It's like if a student sure. is interested in something, we should be able to like if we're interested and they're interested. Why can't that be the dialogue? We're all Let's talk. learning and communicating. <laughs> Let's talk. Like, it's cool. Yeah. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah. And the great but... thing about TikTok is there's no time limit. You know, like it's not like a 45 minute class. I can answer that question anytime I want. Right. And then post anytime that response. and. That generates other questions. Yeah, it's it's really fun. It's it's fun producing science content on TikTok. Yeah, and there's mm -hmm. a niche for everything, which is yeah. really cool. I mean, there's Most an definitely. evolutionary biology niche of TikTok. Like there is, and yeah. there's a cannabis niche of TikTok. There's a you know frog niche of TikTok. There's just everything. You name uh, it. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to also give two book recommendations to the listeners. Yes. I pulled these off my bookshelf and I don't know if you've read these either. Um, this is one of my favorite like um, tabletop books. Like it's just a, it's called Poison Sinister Species with Deadly Consequences. Nice. And it's like, it's kind of just a um, quick read where it talks about like a specific beetle or a specific jellyfish or something. And it, and it says like why it's so deadly and how it kills and you know what's special about it. Uh, plat platypuses, platypi, plat platypi. Is it plat? I think it's platypuses. Platypuses, Plata platypi. Pl platypuses are in here, um, but even some you like didn't know existed. Um, so highly recommend that one for like a coffee table book. But this one I think is the best book ever written on Venoms. I mean, I only have like three, but this is one of my favorites. It's just called Venomous by Christy Wilcox. Um, How Earth's Deadliest Creatures Mastered Biochemistry. Fire cool. book. Highly recommend. Um, so yeah, for any listeners who want to get down this really niche rabbit hole, recommend that and recommend this podcast. <laughs> yeah, love it. Absolutely. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much for being a guest. Um, I've definitely really enjoyed talking to you, and I think, I think we'll convert some people to the to the toxic realm of science. Hopefully, there's just so much cool stuff. Um, and thank you so much for having me. This was a ton of fun. And yeah, let's catch up soon. All right, mad love, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for everyone who supports me on this adventure and this podcast, anyone who's left a review, the amazing patrons who make this possible. And of course, I'm so thankful for nature for teaching me something new absolutely every day. We will be back next week. Hopefully, we'll be traveling for uh, MJ Biz, but I'll try to get an episode out before that. Otherwise, we'll be recording during MJ Biz, and I can't wait to update everyone on that. Yeah.